this is Mr. Coates, and this is Biology Honors uh, video introduction to aquatic ecosystems. One of the things uh, about aquatic ecosystems is that they make up most of the Earth. If you look at uh, planet Earth, and uh, you look at it's got 75% of it's covered with water. And a lot of people think, you know, why should we call it planet Earth? Why don't we just call it planet water? I don't know if it makes much difference, but we are mostly water. So we have to look at some of those aquatic ecosystems and uh, learn about their types. So obviously we have oceanic ecosystems, say saltwater type ecosystems. We also have uh, streams. Streams are flowing water. They're usually highly oxygenated. We also have ponds and lakes, which are uh, standing water ecosystems. So we have quite a few different types of aquatic ecosystems to look at here. All right, so some of the limiting factors that uh, aquatic ecosystems are faced with, a little bit different than terrestrial. For example, dissolved oxygen here. Dissolved oxygen, we don't have that problem in terrestrial ecosystems. The oxygen's all around us in the atmosphere, and you really don't have that problem. However, when you get deep into certain aquatic ecosystems, dissolved oxygen can be a problem unless you have really good water flow. And all living organisms need oxygen in order to survive. Temperature can also be a severe limiting factor to aquatic ecosystems. If we look at this ecosystem here, this uh, lake, we look at the temperature, and at the top, the temperature can be quite warm. But as we go down to the depth of the water, the temperature starts to decrease. And this is because colder water is more dense than warmer water, and so it tends to sink. Because of that, the organisms that live in the warmer water at the surface up here can't survive down here. Light can also be a problem. Obviously, in order to have uh, primary productivity happening on in an ecosystem, you need to have light. And uh, light is uh, very rare in deep uh, water because water is a very good absorber of light. So light doesn't go very far. Uh, pressure is also a problem. The actual pressure, the deeper you get, increases, and certain order, organisms can't handle high pressures. For example, humans, even if we dive, uh, pressure becomes a problem for us. And then the last one here is nutrients. Uh, nutrients, uh, that's a huge limiting factor because you need nutrients in order to grow plants in aquatic ecosystems. And if you don't have enough nutrients, then you don't have primary productivity happening in your aquatic ecosystem. So let's look at uh, this here and look at some of the uh, things that happen with uh, lakes during different months. So this is um, a freshwater lake, uh, can be anywhere. Normally these are more, more northern lakes. We don't see this really happening in Florida too much. But uh, if we look at the different seasons when it comes to lakes, there are certain things that happen. And so during the winter, uh, usually the top of the lake is all frozen. And so water doesn't move that much. You don't get uh, the bottom water coming up and you don't get top water going down. And if you look, the coldest water is here at the surface and then it goes down to four degrees Celsius here. And so you don't have too much stratification or layering when it comes to cold water times. The interesting thing here though is the ice on top. One of the special properties about water is that its solid form, ice, is less dense than its liquid form. And so this allows ice to float up on the surface here and not freeze all the organisms that live at the bottom of the lake here. And so that's pretty important when it comes to life and water. Let's go into spring. What happens in spring, as the water warms up, the surface starts to warm up first. And so some of this cold water that was at the surface tends to start sinking. And what that does, it brings up some of the water from the bottom, and that gets to warm up as well. And when that happens, nutrients that are down here, that have been trapped down here all winter long, also are brought to the surface. Now, as we go into summer, once again, we get stratification happening. So the warmer water stays on the surface, so we have this layer of warm water across the surface here. And uh, then the bottom lake stays very cold. And once again, organisms that can handle this temperature can't go up to here and handle this temperature and vice versa. Then we get fall turnover. Fall turnover happens to be one of the most important times of turnover. Once again, the surface water up here starts to cool off and starts to fall, and it brings warmer temperatures down here and then colder water up to the surface again from the bottom. And so this is the fall turnover when the water moves. And so when turnover happens, dissolved oxygen brought from the surface down to the depths you can also get nutrients brought from the depths up to the surface where algae and other 
plant life can then start using those nutrients to grow. These turnover times are very special times for lakes because that's when you can get algae blooms and you can get a higher pri primary productivity happening during those times than in, say, of course, the winter and then also sometimes during the summer. Now, let's talk about some freshwater ecosystems. There are two main types of freshwater ecosystems. There are standing water ecosystems and flowing freshwater ecosystems. Obviously, streams and rivers are your flowing ecosystems. Those tend to have a, a higher dissolved oxygen content than our standing water because the water is constantly moving. So let's look at freshwater ecosystems like ponds and see how they're uh, divided up based upon physical characteristics like like and depth. So the first zone we're going to look at is the littoral zone, which is right here. And the littoral zone is the zone uh, where the water meets the shore. In this zone, you have high light. You usually have lots of plants growing both in and uh, uh, emerging out of the water. So this you'll find cattails and you find lily pads. Uh, animals you find in this zone here in Florida, alligators, obviously. You'd find um, frogs are good, good organisms to find this. A lot of insects in the littoral zone. Usually the littoral zone in a pond or lake is the most diverse zone. Once we get out away from the shore, we get into the limnetic zone. So this is the open water. Uh, open surface water area of uh, the pond here. So this is where you have your phytoplankton and zooplankton that live in the upper surface here. Um, and then uh, obviously some fish and other animals that live in this area. So those are distances from shore type zones. Let's look at depths here. As we go deeper here, we get into the profundal zones. Usually it's dark and cold. There's no light in this area at all. And uh, you don't have a whole lot of fish in this area unless they're specifically adapted to this area. And also there's no light because this is also in the light zone called the aphotic zone, which is a light zone. Uh, like I said before, water is a very good filter of light. And so a lot of light does not get down into deep areas. Above the uh, aphotic zone is the area where light then penetrates, and that's the photic zone where the light is. And then the last zone is the benthic zone. The benthic zone is this entire bottom zone, no matter how deep or shallow. This is the benthic zone. Organisms that live in the benthic zone are called benthos. Good examples are like crayfish. Worms are good examples. Snails, clams, all good examples of benthic organisms. Now we have transitional ecosystems as well when it comes to aquatic. So we have the swamps, freshwater swamps and bogs. This is a cypress swamp here. You can tell these are cypress trees because they have the knees, which are this little guy right here and these guys here are cypress knees. And these are parts of the roots of the cypress trees that come up out of this swamp area. The reason why they do that is to exchange oxygen with the surrounding environment. Usually swamps and bogs have uh, no oxygen underneath the water here and uh, they have very uh, anoxic sediments, very thick sediments, a lot of decaying matter in those sediments, and so there's no oxygen in there. So in order for some of these trees to get oxygen to their roots, they have these knees that come up out of the, the water to do that. Also, you can have bogs. Bogs don't have trees, but they have all kinds of mosses in them, uh, and uh, they're quite wet all the time, and these mosses then decay over time, creating peat areas. Another transition aquatic ecosystem is an estuary. An estuary is an area where you have fresh water flowing into salt water. Uh, Tampa Bay is an excellent estuary. We are the largest estuary in the state of Florida. And in uh, estuaries, you can find uh, lots of grasses. So this is a uh, grassy or a temperate estuary down here. And you see all these different grasses that grow in the water. And then you can also have tropical estuaries where you have mangroves. And these are red mangroves. You can tell that by these prop roots that are in this area. These prop roots help the mangrove stay in the water and uh, prop itself up. And obviously this is at low tide. Uh, and so you can see the muddy bottom here. High tide probably comes up to this point and low tide is all the way out to here. So we have a pretty good tidal range here. That's another thing about estuaries. They are highly tidal. So you can have these grasses sometimes totally unindated with water and sometimes you actually see the mud bottom in between these grasses. Another thing about estuaries is that you get zones in them too. And this is so you get the barnacle zone on top and then oysters down at the bottom here. Oysters 
and barnacles usually live together in estuaries and they can handle these tidal conditions. It's very important that organisms that live in these areas can handle changing tides, changing salinities, and also changing temperatures. Because when this tide comes in and out, temperatures could change fairly quickly depending on what the air temperature is. All right, saltwater ecosystems, our last major ecosystem. Now, with saltwater ecosystems, we're talking about oceans and seas and gulfs. These are very large aquatic ecosystems, and they also have zones. So we're going to look at all those zones. Okay, so the first zone we want to look at is the intertidal zone. The intertidal zone is this zone between high tide and low tide, where the water meets the shore. So between high tide and low tide. The organisms that live here, once again, have to be highly adapted to a lot of change. They can withstand uh, pounding waves sometimes. Sometimes they can withstand changing temperatures. Uh, sometimes they might get trapped in a tide pool for long periods of time and get heated up. And so they have to withstand that those kind of changes in order to survive. The next zone is the pelagic zone. The pelagic zone is this area out into open ocean past the continental shelf. This is all the open water it is pelagic. The next zone is the benthic zone. Once again, the benthic zone, just like freshwater, is all of the bottom. No matter how deep or shallow we go, this is all the benthic zone. Once again, animals that live on the in the benthic zone in the ocean are called benthos, so you can have crabs and lobsters, shrimps, snails, worms, uh, stingrays are good benthic animals. Then the deepest zone down here where there's no light is the abyssal zone. Okay, this is the deepest part of the ocean. It's very cold. It's very dark. This is where you get organisms that have bioluminescence and they use that to hunt their prey and also to find mates. Now also if you notice down here at the very bottom of the ocean in some places we have these hydrothermal vents. Hydrothermal vents are another way we can create primary productivity in the ocean. Primary productivity would only usually occur in this area up here, which is the photic zone, just like in lakes. And so this is where uh, the photosynthesis can happen, and that's where your primary productivity occurs. However, down deep in the ocean, since 1970, we found these hydrothermal vents, and they spray out sulfur and uh, there are bacteria then that can convert that sulfur into usable energy for the rest of the ecosystem. So down here there is an entire ecosystem just based on sulfur and it was the first time we ever found an ecosystem that did not need light. And uh, so it's quite interesting ecosystems and we've found several different types that don't need light since then but this occurred fairly recently back in the 1970s. Well that's all you need to know about uh, aquatic ecosystems, make sure you know about the different conditions that exist, light versus no light, cold versus warm water. All right, pause the video and answer these three comprehension questions in your notes and we'll discuss them on the day we grade them. I hope uh, that is helpful.